In the early 1900s, Jack London wrote a short story called To Build a Fire. In the story, there is an unnamed man who decides to go on a long hike through the forests bordering the Yukon River. The only problem is, is that the temperature has fallen to minus 59 degrees. But he thinks this is going to be a great adventure. At the beginning of the story, there is an older man who advises against this. As he's about to set off on the journey, his dog advises him against this. Not in an actual voice, but in all the mannerisms that a dog can show to say, I don't want to do this. Uh, The conditions outside obviously advise against this. But despite being warned by all of these things, this guy decides to set out anyway. And this is what we read in London's story. All this, the mysterious far-reaching hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold, and the strangeness and weirdness of it all made no impression on the man. It did not lead him to meditate on his frailty as a creature of temperature and upon man's frailty in general, able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold. And from there on, it did not lead him into the conjectural field of immortality in man's place in the universe. Fifty degrees below zero, that there should be anything more to it than that, never entered his head. And so he set out on the journey. Now, this story has no surprise ending. It ends exactly how you expect it to end. As I've said already a number of times in the introductory sermons to Romans, Paul is arguing at the beginning of Romans that real reality really matters. And yet, despite that, we continue to come up with ingenious ways of denying real reality and affirming our own truths. Instead of acknowledging real reality, we conceive ourselves as the author of reality. Uh, Paul says that this is to deny the creator and also to deny the creation in its right order and its right place. Instead of living within the laws of God and the laws of creation and the laws of nature, we twist creation and we twist ideas about God. Paul says that when we do this, we come up with unnatural desires. And, And Paul doesn't mince words as to what happens when we do this. In chapter 1, he said, as a result, their minds became dark, their minds became confused, and even though they claimed to be wise, instead, they became fools. And with the result of this, moving us to an anti-creation. Since creation leads to life, denying creation, denying the creator, denying the order of real reality leads to anti-creation, which is death, the natural consequences. And so Paul goes on to say, therefore, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. They suffered within themselves. This is a natural consequence. Paul also says that God abandoned them to their own way. He gave us free choice. Let us go our own way. And we suffered within ourselves the very natural consequences of going against creation and the creator. So no matter how firmly the man in London's story felt that his reality could overcome minus 59 conditions. No matter how much faith he had in his personal truth, that he could live through and hike through minus 59 degrees temperatures, real reality killed him. 
London even pokes fun in the story, and he, in a lot of his stories, is trying to show the, the, the real reality of nature and the strength of nature. So in this story as well, you see a lot of the characteristics of the dog, who is very reluctant to go, are so stupid. People are such idiots. Or if we look at some of the morality of it, we will r- read Romans 1 and go, People are just horrible. We probably say this several times to our television sets when we watch the evening news. What morons human beings can be. I mean, you just watch the news, follow anything that's going on in the world, and you got the circus of the Trump trials. You got people punching other people with their friends recording it so that they can post it on the internet. You got transgender women breaking female weight lifting records by hundreds of pounds. You've got teenage girls getting gang raped by elite hockey players on teams like Team Canada. You've got teachers snapping inappropriate pictures of kids in their class. You've got seniors that are being exploited online by money scams. You've got people in the lower mainland getting sucked into pyramid schemes and all kinds of weird sex and money cults like Nexium. You got houses that after they've gone through the devastation of flood and fires, you then got people running through the towns looting these houses. And then you've got all kinds of horrible fashion trends, like shorts that are so short that the butt hangs on the outside of the shorts rather than on the inside of the shorts. And you look at all this and go, what is going on with our world? It's a crazy time and a crazy place to live in. And this is exactly how the Jewish community in Paul's day would have seen Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 was saying the same thing to all of them, and they would have read Romans chapter 1, had so much affirmation, and said the world is so messed up. It's such a mess. It's how many church preachers love to preach today to the delight and the affirmation of their congregation look at how horrible the world is look at how stupid the world is look at the kinds of things they get into because they deny the creator they deny the natural laws of the universe we as a human race are so messed up and then as Jesus so often does in his parables where there's a twist once he kind of sucks you in at the beginning of the parable. Paul does the same thing. As the Jewish audience is affirming and and totally with Paul in chapter 1 and with us today as church communities or the people of God, the pious community, listen to chapter 1 and affirm all of this right as we're getting comfortable and feeling good about ourselves Then Paul starts chapter 2 this way. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For who you judge, or sir, for you who judge others do the very same things. And you go, ouch. And you go, it's no wonder Paul had such a hard time having friends. I mean, he just seems to alienate people on both sides. Just when he's kind of got all these people kind of affirming him in Romans 1, then he pulls the rug out from all of them and he gets them too in Romans chapter 2. After the opening diatribe on the human rebellion against God and creation, Paul turns his pen towards the people who would say they affirm God and they affirm the right order of his creation. These would be the people who say, we're the ones who get it right. We're the ones who do understand who God is. And then Paul says shockingly to these people, you are just as bad. You do the very same things. And you are about to face the same punishment. Now, 
How is that even possible? I mean, I don't look anything like a Romans 1 person. How can you be talking to me and to my tribe in this way? Well, Paul has no problem getting specific. He says a little bit later, well, okay, I'll give you some examples. You say that it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use stolen items from the pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking the law. No wonder Scripture says, The Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Sadly, we can see and hear how contemporary what Paul is saying is for us today in our church culture. How are those outside the church? How are the Romans one people outside of the church, to hear the message about God and who He is and His character and His creation and about morality and about humanity's place in His creation? How are they to hear that message from God's people when within our own churches we have the constant scandal of Catholic priests abusing children? Or the recent discovery that was published with the Southern Baptist Church. It was, uh, they did a 20-year study of the Southern Baptist Church and found out that almost 400 of its clergy, lay leaders and volunteers, had faced allegations of sexual misconduct, leaving upwards to 700 victims. We hear and constantly see the televangelists flying on their private jets and constantly mismanaging church money for their own personal gain. There seems to be almost a weekly scandal of a new celebrity pastor who's fallen into some kind of egomaniac power thing or sexual scandal or money scandal. The ECFA, which is an accreditation agency for over 200 or 2,700 different parachurch ministries, just in an article this week in Christianity Today, said that one of the greatest financial risks posed to churches and ministries today is the moral failure of its leaders that is simply becoming epidemic. It seems that the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you still applies. And this is what Paul is trying to say. You can say all you want about those people in Romans 1, those people that are outside of the faith, but you inside of the faith are doing so many of the same things, and the fact that you are doing them, and yet you are saying you're under the name of God, it even makes it harder for those outside of the faith to see the truth and see the light. In fact, the very reason that so many of them blaspheme the name of God is because they simply cannot see the truth of God because of you. You are essentially culprits in their fall. But here Paul does it again. As we now judge the church for how messed up it is, and as we sit and say, yeah, I mean, there are so many arrogant and stupid church leaders there are so many selfish and self-serving ministries in churches we always when we think that mean them over there those people even if we want to look denominationally we say well we're not catholics i mean you, you, you talked about the catholics oh we're not southern baptists you, that was a southern baptist thing you know oh no it's them over there the church down the street all of those other people it never means us because of course we're the good christians we're the good kind so paul says it again you may think you can condemn such people but you are just as bad you have no excuse When you say they are wicked and they should be punished, you end up condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. The bottom line of what Paul wants to say here is that we are all judgy. 
The double bottom line is they are all unjustly judgy. The triple bottom line that he wants to say here is that we condemn ourselves by our unjust judgy judgments of other people. Christians judging homosexuals or Christians judging Christians for judging homosexuals or homosexuals judging Christians for not judging Christians for judging homosexuals. And on and on and on it goes. In his usual satirical lyrics, Steve Taylor sings, can't understand those Christians, so you type us all in stereo. They're hypocrites. They're such a bore. Well, come on in. There's room for one more. We are unjust judges. We're believing in the justice of our cause can even cause us to be unjust. Even if the justice of the cause that we believe in is a good cause and is truth, it's very easy, even in a just cause, in trying to push for that, we become the monster in the process. A number of studies have even shown that, that standing for a just cause can so easily corrupt us to become the very horrible people that we are fighting against. We're even judgy towards God. And in our judginess gets things wrong all the time. In fact, our judginess really gets God wrong. In the midst of all of this, listen in Romans what Paul says about God. So after Romans 2, 1, where he says, you who condemn all those other people, you're just as bad. Just a couple of verses later, he then starts talking about God in verse 4 and says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Those are striking words in regards to everything he said so far about humanity in chapter 1 and now in regards to the religious in chapter 2. All of a sudden, he says, in contrast to all of you people in the faith, outside of the faith, in the church, outside of the church, Jew, Gentile, all of you people, don't you realize how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? And we think, of our, we think to ourselves, wait a minute, that's not how we think about God. Uh, qualities like kindness, tolerance, and patience, that's how we like to think about ourselves. We're kind, tolerant, and patient. But the complete opposite continues to reveal itself. Even the rainbow flag today, which is supposed to represent these very values of kindness, tolerance, and patience, is increasingly becoming a symbol of intolerance. It's like people spewing hatred and threats while waving a peace symbol. But wait a minute, you might ask. Didn't you say just the other week that Romans talks about God's anger from heaven? So how do you match that up? In fact, today's passage, when you go a little bit further, it also talks about God pouring out his anger, God pouring out his wrath, and destroying people who continue in their sin. I mean, that sounds very judgy. So how can you then say, or how can Paul say, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is? Well, the difference is that God isn't judgy, it's that God's the judge. And there's a big difference. See, everyone agrees that we do need justice. There would be very few people that would actually believe that anarchy would be a wonderful system to live under. Everybody believes there's justice. And so that seems to be a not negotiable. We all believe that there's justice and we all believe there should be justice. In fact, that's why we're judgy. That's why we all yell at referees, because we want justice, and we think the referee hasn't seen things right and hasn't brought about justice. If we didn't think that there should be justice, we'd just be like, whatever, but we want justice. So it's just that our approach to justice, what Paul's saying, is unjust and wrong, because we 
use ourselves as the standard on which to make justice possible. And our standards twist the real standard, which is God and his creation. And so we become unjust judges judging unjustly. And therefore, in a situation like that, whoever holds the most power wins. If everybody's unjust and everybody's judging in an unjust way, well, then who wins? It's who's the strongest. It's why the powers and ideologies that take out the old powers and ideologies usually end up just as bad, sometimes even worse. Beautifully and brilliantly illustrated in George Orwell's Animal Farm, probably one of my favorite books. It's just a short little book. I'd encourage anyone to read it. Beautifully illustrated that the very people that try to take out the powers above them, when they get into power, they do the same things. The difference with God, however, is what we see in verse 5. Why is God able to be the judge and to bring about proper justice while at the same time being patient, tolerant, and kind? It's because in verse 5, as we see, it says that it is under His righteous judgment. There's the difference. As Paul has argued in Romans 1, this righteousness has been infused into the very fabric of creation. God is right. God's very character is righteousness. His very being is the standard of morality. The two are not two separate things. God did not arbitrarily say, I'm going to come up with some rules. I'm going to come up with morality and then invent something. It is his very character that is then reflected in his creation because creation is simply an outburst of him expressing himself. And so his character of who he is is infused into creation. His very being and our understanding of Christians as Christians, knowing that God is triune, three and one, is that his very being is eternally love. There's been eternal love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And out of that love, he creates. And out of that love comes life. And therefore, the very creation is infused with love. And sin is that which goes against love and which goes against creation. And so he is the right one. So therefore, in that sense and in that truth, he can rightly judge. That's why Paul says in regards to how this has manifested itself into the very created order, he says in chapter 2, even Gentiles, even those Roman 1 Gentiles who do not have God's written law, That was given to the Jews. The Jews were given the the, the Bible, the Moses, and all the writings of the Old Testament were through through the prophets that came from the Jewish people. But even Gentiles who do not have God's written law. In fact, that would imply to even Gentiles, like First Nations people, who for hundreds and hundreds of years never knew about the Bible, never had missionaries coming to them, never had any contact like that. So even people like that, Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. What Paul is saying here is that even the created order, and we being people of creation. We can know certain things intuitively. We can know there's a creator because there's creation around us. We can know certain moral truths. We have a conscience. We we should be able to know certain things about right or wrong. That is why those outside of the faith sometimes get it right. That's why sometimes our our unbelieving neighbors that maybe have never even cracked open a Bible in their entire life sometimes can, can outshine us. Because there is a certain morality that they intuitively know is right. Just as those who have God's law 
revealed to them also know this. So Paul just says a few verses later, now you who call yourselves Jews, we could also now in a contemporary way put ourselves into this and say you who call yourselves Christians, you rely on God's law, you rely on God's scripture. You even boast about your special relationship with him. Well, then you know what he wants. You know what is right because you've been taught by his law. Both Gentiles or unbelievers or Jews or Christians and believers both have a way of knowing the truth. As the church father Irenaeus taught us, the basics of the requirements of the moral law in the Old Testament are simply an exposition of the natural law. It's not like the two are opposed to each other. The scriptures go much deeper and the scriptures go much further in, but they're just an expression, they're just a deeper exposition of the natural laws. There's no contradiction, just further clarity. Which is why Paul can say in this section, for God does not show favoritism. There's no favoritism. And yet, Paul's conclusion in all of this is that only God is righteous. Only God is the one who gets it right. So therefore, those outside of having the actual written scriptures know intuitively in their conscience and sometimes obey that and do what is right, they generally tend to do what's wrong and what's self-serving. And yet, at the same time, those who actually have God's revealed scripture... Only God is the one who consistently lives within his own character. And therefore, he is the one who is able to rightly judge. In fact, the interesting thing is that even if we simply held ourselves or or held other people to our own standard, every single one of us would fail. So if we ever wonder about, well, how's it going to be fair on Judgment Day? I heard one analogy that if you had your phone and every single time you said to somebody else, you know what, you really should do this, or you really shouldn't do this, or it's not fair. If your phone recorded every single time you said that, your expectations and your standards for everybody else, and it recorded all that. And then at the end of your life, it said, okay, all we're going to do is we're going to judge you based on your own standards for everybody else. So then they played that back for you and then examined your life to see if you lived up to the standards you expected from everyone else. Guess how many of us would pass? None of us. So there really is no excuse. We will fail And not only God's standards and the standards he put in creation, but we will fail our own standards. That's why God is the only one who is the righteous judge. And yet, he judges with wonderful kindness, tolerance, and patience. Why? Paul explains why. He says he does this because his kindness is intended to turn us from our sin. I mean, think about that. This is God's character. We're so often judgy and get things wrong that we do the same thing with God and have this tyrant view of God. And the reality is, is that he is the only one who's right and he's the only one who judges right. And yet he is the one who is kind, tolerant, and patient. And even to the nth degree for 
us who are unrighteous. He's not wanting to immediately come in and judge. But he's trying to give us all the opportunity that we can because his kindness is intended for us to turn from sin and death and self-defeat and destruction. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning. Have you ever wondered why Adam and Eve didn't drop dead as soon as they sinned? Why didn't they bite into that fruit and then just die? I mean, God said, you can freely indulge, enjoy my garden, my creation and all that. Just, just one tree, don't eat of it. And then he gave them the warning. He said, the consequences of that is if you eat from this tree, you will die. Disobedience towards the life giver. Rebellion against life is the natural consequence of death. But that's exactly what they did. They did eat. They did disobey God. And yet, they didn't drop dead. At least not right away. I mean, eventually they did, but it was a long time later. Why was it not right away? Well, Abraham Cowper provided me with an insight I had never thought about before, which I think is quite profound in the fact that what he says is that right here at the very beginning, in the fact that they did not die immediately when God gave them the warning that they would die from eating this, is an act already of God's immediate grace. His wonderful, kind, tolerant patience intended to turn us from our sin. Kelper writes, Surely die? But this is not what happened. And precisely in the fact that it did not happen in this way, we see that grace enters and begins to function right at the beginning. The eating of this tree will lead you into sin, and the necessary consequences of sin is death. Death immediately, death continually, until the end, unless I, your God, in my mercy, arrest the continuing consequences of sin. Right at the beginning, the very fact that they did not die instantly was because God, in His mercy and in His grace, preserved them and let them continue to live, not just for no reason, but to give them all the opportunity to repent, to turn their life around, and to turn back to God. How unfair our judginess judges God and gets Him wrong. Now, of course, all of this doesn't mean that we shouldn't have judges in our land. Romans 13, we'll talk about that. Paul talks about government and the need for judges and for authority in Romans chapter 13. But in recognizing our tendency to judge wrong and the example of the true judge as the kind, tolerant, and patient, perfect judge, the reach of human officials and human judges should be extremely limited. This is part of our heritage that is being forgotten. That the theological base roots of modern democracy is built on the whole understanding of human brokenness, human sin, human tendency to get it wrong, and the fact that there is a morality higher than just what's in our own heads. So we obviously need to protect society from the worst kinds of evil. People who destroy other people's lives. That obviously has to happen. And so we need to have judges and leaders and people in place to do that. But there should be generally a fairly libertine approach to most things in society. 
That's why our democratic societies have been founded also on the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and all of these different ideas of freedom. Even freedom, and here's something we have to understand as Christians, even freedom granted to allow consenting adults to do what they want to do in the privacy of their own bedroom. See, where we mix things up sometimes as Christians is that civil law is not morality. Civil law, just because all of a sudden the government decides, okay, we're going to legalize marijuana, does not mean, wow, yesterday it was bad, today it's good. Yesterday it was unhealthy, today it's healthy. I mean, that's not what law is for. Law in the land is to protect people and to give people freedom. So just because something is a law doesn't mean it is moral. You can read about all the negative results of trying to deal with alcoholism through prohibition. It didn't work. In fact, the government end up becoming the morality police, ended up having them become the very oppressors in a situation that was trying to deal with a real problem in society. We have to understand that you cannot force beliefs. You cannot force conscience on other people by law and by threats. When you try to do that, whether it's trying to do that by creating a Christian society or by trying to create a Muslim society or by trying to create an LGBTQ plus society, every single time it becomes intolerance, it becomes oppressive, and we become unjust judges within that very system. And so what we need to understand is that the very roots of democracy, the very roots that gave us the culture that we gave us today, is to understand how as humans we often get it wrong, and that God is right. And so yes, we need to have certain laws, we have to have certain protection in our land for the worst kind of evils, but on the other side we need to generally allow for freedom, because even God allowed that. God gave warnings, and as the Christian church, we certainly can give warnings to people and say, don't go down this path. Even if it's legal, don't go down this path. There's negative consequences to it, but you do have the freedom to do that. You do have the freedom to make that choice. That's the very foundation of democracy, and it wasn't created just arbitrarily. It was created in an understanding of the very character of what God's like with us, and what we are like as sinful people. Yes, a day of judgment will come. And in His grace, God holds off allowing people a time to come under the conviction of sin. But God never forces. And therefore, if God doesn't force, why do we think it's our prerogative to force people into certain kinds of moral ways of living. He allows us to go our way. He allows us to continue in sin. In time, in the hopes that we'll recognize that we are sinners, in the hopes that we'll recognize the destructive path that we're going on, and in the hopes that we will repent. In the hopes that we will recognize that, wow, I'm a pretty judgy person, and I need saving. Remember way back at the beginning, Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, the church and churches in Rome, to proclaim the good news. He starts off the first three chapters with a whole bunch of bad news, because he really wants us to get the bad news for us to get the good news. If I don't understand the bad news, good news, if if I have no concept that I have cancer. I don't believe I have cancer. I've never been told I have cancer. And I've never even had an inkling of anxiety that there's cancer in me. Because it's just not been... And then a doctor comes up to me randomly and says, guess what? You're cancer-free. I'm going to be like, yay. I mean, this is not really big news, good news. Because I didn't even think that I had cancer or know that I had cancer or believe that I have cancer. I got to understand my diagnosis of what the problem is before good news can be announced. 
And so that's why Paul is doing this. He's giving all the bad news so that we'll begin to understand the good news. Now remember, his overarching good news message is this. That through Christ's death and resurrection, God is creating one true Jew-Gentile family through whom he plans to rescue and redeem his creation. That's his ultimate message in Romans. God, through Jesus' death and resurrection, is creating one new family. It's a family of Jew and Gentile who have recognized what God has done, have received the forgiveness they can find in God, and then in becoming a new family, through them God begins to rescue his creation, which ultimately one day when he comes back, he will put it all right again. And this is his message also precisely to the problem that's going on with the church in Rome. And that is that the church in Rome was struggling with disunity. It was struggling with disunity between the Jews and the Gentiles. They were having race issues, superiority issues, cultural issues. The fact that the gospel was now going out to all people and people were becoming followers of Jesus from Jewish background and Gentile backgrounds and now beginning to come to church together, they didn't instantly have all of their views about each other annihilated. There were still plenty of cultural and racist and stereotypical and bigoted views between the two groups. But Paul deals with this in the opposite way that we would think is proper. So instead of having these two factions come in and they're all kind of fighting and kind of holding each other at distance and, and trying to figure out what this all means, that they're now followers of Jesus just like I am, and yet they're Jews or they're Gentiles. Instead of bringing them all together and saying, guys... And girls, you are all God's special glittering golden stars. You are all wonderful angels with halos over your heads. And God just wants you to come together and love each other and realize how special and unique and beautiful you really are. That's not what Paul does. That's what we would think we would do. That's what we like to tell our elementary school kids. You're all special. Every single one of you is number one. They hopefully we'll figure out later that that mathematically is impossible. But that's the kind of things we tell people. But Paul doesn't go there. Paul knows that that actually only feeds an unhealthy ego. That actually feeds our untruth. It feeds our sinfulness. It simply proclaiming an untruth. And all that could do at best is create a kind of superficial uniformity that on the surface everybody looks like they're getting along just barely, but it's never really teaching people to love. That kind of advice is as good as telling a man freezing to death at minus 59 degrees Celsius that all he has to do is think warm thoughts and he will survive. The dog did not die. You've been holding that the whole time. I should have left you in suspense. The dog was smart enough, and after the man dies, he goes and finds shelter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yay for the dog. Instead, what Paul does is Paul says, we got to deal with real reality. Real reality is where we have to go because the truth sets people free. So, the truth is, is that there is something that unites Jews and Gentiles. There is something at base level to try to bring all you people together. And so he writes chapter 1 about the Gentiles and their background and where they come from. Then he writes chapter 2 and their background, and the Jews, and what they're like, and where they come from, and he says at the end of it all, guess what? All of you guys are a bunch of losers. All of you guys get it wrong. That's why in chapter 3, he sums it all up and says, guess what? No one is righteous. Not even one. 
No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. It's a bit redundant, but Paul wants to get his point across. As Preston Sprinkle reminds us in regards to Paul's earlier words in chapter 1, where he talks about same-sex relationships and how that's sinful, and sometimes we zero in on that, Preston Sprinkle, I think, says it wonderfully when he says, Paul doesn't write this chapter or these chapters to condemn gay people. He writes this stuff to condemn all people. That's his point. His point isn't like, oh, yeah, those people over there, those people. He writes this whole thing to say, guess what? You religious people, you non-religious people, you people that sleep with these people, you people that steal, you people that this, you people that this. He's like, at the end, of, even, you, even you people who try to follow the Bible, you do it very selfishly. You do, you're all sinful. No sin is exempt and no sin gets a special pass. Everybody is a guilty sinner. Whether we've been exposed to God's righteous law in the Bible, or whether we have been exposed to it simply by the laws of nature, even according to our own standards of other people, we fail. And in other person in recognizing our sinfulness we actually become much healthier because we become more cautious about judging other people we become more humble in realizing our weakness and realizing that we have blind spots we become more forgiving and more tolerant towards others who are struggling things or who, through things or who don't see the way that we do. We become more willing to leave things up to God. Even God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We, we, we become more willing to just, in some ways, you got to live and let live. God will sort it out. The recognition of our sinfulness would give us much healthier communities, much healthier churches, much healthier governments, much healthier families. And if God is wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient to us with the intention to turn us from our sin, it also means right there that there's some good news. If God is like this with the intention to turn us from our sin, it also means that sin does not have to remain our forever situation. We are all united because of the fact that we're all sinners. No matter where we come from or what our background is, we're all the same. And yet, if he's patient to turn us from our sins, it means that we can turn. Or that would be a useless thing to be patient for. And the hope comes to all of us in the same way. So not only are we all united by the fact that we are all sinners, we're all united in the fact that sin can be forgiven in the same way, which also unites us. There's not many paths and many different ways to be forgiven. Again, once you scratch past the superficiality of so many of the worldviews today, uh, you realize that they actually are quite intolerant. Uh, I, I remember one time I was at a gathering and there was a Baha'i speaker. And the Baha'i speaker, and it was really funny because the Baha'i speaker, well, there, I, I represented Christianity, there was a Muslim there, there were all these different faith groups there, a Jewish person there. And the Baha'i speaker got up and the Baha'i speaker was like, all, all paths are true. All roads lead to heaven. You guys are all saying the same thing just in different ways. Just all this, uh, and, and he at the superficial level, it came across as like, here is the person that is uniting us all. And yet when he was done, the Jew, the Muslim, the Christian, everybody across the table said, we all disagree with you. In fact, you are telling all of us that we're all wrong, and you're right. Because you're telling all, because Muslims don't believe that, Christians don't believe that, Jews don't believe that. So you're basically coming here and you're saying, you're in, on a superficial level, you're saying you're all, but, but you're saying every single one of you who believes in your faith, every single one of you is wrong. 
And I am right, and I recognize that all of you are actually saying the exact same thing. And if you follow my way, then... And, and, we, and it, the ironic thing of the whole thing is he was the most intolerant of all of us. Because at least when I talk to the Muslim person, I could say... I disagree with you. He could say, I disagree with you. And we can have a dialogue and a debate. And we can start looking at history. And we can get into it. But the Baha'i person, I would say, and he'd just say, yeah, your truth is just as... I mean, I, how? Muslims don't believe Jesus died on the cross. Jesus, Christians do believe Jesus died on the cross. How can you say we're both saying the same thing? It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. This is the problem with this. What Paul is saying is that there aren't many pathways. The many pathways say, well, there's this pathway, this pathway, this pathway. It separates us all again. And then, well, my pathway was a little bit more superior than your pathway. Paul is saying, no. You know what unites us all? We're all sinners. We're all broken. doesn't matter what culture or background or history or situation that you come from. You're all broken. And guess what? There's a loving, caring God who is offering forgiveness to all people in the exact same way that you can be forgiven of your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross in objective time, space, and history and rose from the dead to give you new life. It's not something you earn. It's not something you can possess yourself. It's not something you can do. It's a pure gift and it's given to everybody. So therefore, there is no barriers, no ranks among God's people because they simply are sinners who've been given a gift. That's why Paul says this, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, this is not from yourself. And guess what happens when it's not from yourself? It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done or even figured out on our own. So none of us can boast about it. So there you go. We're all united because we're all sinners. And we all can be united in being forgiven. And when we're all united in being forgiven, none of us can boast about that. Because we didn't do anything to forgive ourselves. The only thing we can boast about, and Paul says this elsewhere too, he says, the only thing I can boast about is Christ and His work. That's what Paul is trying to say to this community. Jews, Gentiles, who have now come together in Christ, there shouldn't be all these factions and divisions within you. You're the new people of God. You're the new family. You're all equal because you all were sinners and you were all were saved and forgiven in exactly the same way it's in Christ. Therefore, live as my united people and begin to proclaim this wonderful message to everybody else that they can equally be part of this family. And through you all, my creation will be restored. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's so easy to miss your message and to become arrogant, to become boastful, to become holier than thou, to become condemning. But Lord, we need to recognize that if we're sinners, it's no wonder so many people in our sphere of influence don't get it, because they're sinners too. And there's really no difference between us and them. Different sins maybe, but still separation from you. Lord, the only thing we can do is say thank you, and, and we worship you, and we bow before you, and lift you up as one who is patient, kind, and tolerant, and loving, and forgiving. It's a gift. We thank you for that gift. Lord, there's nothing that we can do or boast about the fact that we have received that gift. It's all a work of you. And so, Lord, we think of those people right now that don't know of you and don't know forgiveness. We think of people in our own families, our own children, our friends, maybe even that antagonistic neighbor that's constantly challenging our faith, or whoever it may be. And Lord, we recognize that all of these people need forgiveness. They are all broken in their different ways, and 
some ways very much they're lashing out or, or maybe their apathy or whatever it is are just different defense mechanisms to try to continue to go down their own truth paths. But Lord, we pray that they will come to a realization and a recognition that that's a futile way to live. That there is no real hope in just living for ourselves. We pray, God, that they will come to a place of brokenness to say, I need to find out what it means to find love and forgiveness and to be able to live free of myself and the things that constantly cause me anxiety. And so, Lord, we pray that you, in your power, through your Holy Spirit, will invade these people's lives and convict them and draw them to you so that they, too, can understand the power of forgiveness and be part of your family. And may we live this out, Lord. May we extend love and forgiveness onto other people because you have done that to us. And may we live as people of life and joy and goodness because that's who you intended us to be. May we be reflections of our Creator. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.